Good morning. If you would please open your Bibles to the minor prophet of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3. Those of you that are visiting with us, welcome and thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to come out this way and be with us. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, well, thank you especially to you for finding the or, or feeling the need to come out and praise God, to feeling the need to open your hearts up to God's Word. It is my pleasure to be before you and to present to you what I believe is a very important message from the Word of God, that message being repentance. In Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2, we read where, where John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus to begin his earthly ministry at the age of 30. And the scripture says that part of the message that John was preaching was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice how he begins or how he emphasizes repentance in his message. In order for one to meet the kingdom, to receive the kingdom, he says you must repent because it is a hand. So there was a sense of urgency. And he says, for this is the one referred to by the, by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 8, therefore, when he speaks to these people that were coming to be baptized by John the Baptist, and after he calls them brood of vipers, and he says, who, who told you about this? Why, why are you coming to, to be baptized? He says, therefore, if you truly are going to be of a repentant heart, if you truly are going to turn away from your sin, from the life that you've been living, you need to bear fruit that is in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit that is in keeping with repentance. You know, when we talk about repentance, there is, by implication, the idea that there's going to be forgiveness, or, or else why would we repent? When John said here, repent for the kingdom, of hand, uh, 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 the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's because there was the hope of, of, of forgiveness, the, the hope of being received by, by God. And when we look at the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1 is, is a great a chapter that introduces us to this character, this prophet God that was, in my opinion, a cantankerous angry, disobedient prophet. Because when God said to him, I want you to go to Nineveh, the great and wicked city, and tell it that it must repent, Jonah said no. And look at there in, in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Instead of going to Mallorca, Spain, to Tarshish, he decides to go west. All right, instead of going to, Tar to, to Nineveh, he goes west to, to Spain, to Mallorca, Spain, to Tarshish. And the scripture never says that he was trying to hide from God, but that he was going as far away as he could from the presence of God. Now, have you ever wondered why he said from the presence of God? Why the scripture here says that he was trying to flee from the presence of God? Now, when we Christians are in sin, when we are living a life that is not in accordance to God's word, where's the last place that we want to be? Every time that you read about the presence of the Lord, it's usually referring to the temple, is it not? When the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, Literally, God would move in, would tabernacle, and as a evidence, there would be smoke. And people on the outside would see the smoke, that God was literally there, that the presence of God was there. When God was on the mountain with Moses, the mountain shook, and there was fire, there was lightning, and there was smoke. The presence of the Lord was there. 
So here we find Jonah wanting to be as far away from the temple, far away from anywhere where God's people would, would, could find him or could see him. Because what happens when we are in sin, when we have been, as Christians, living a life in sin, and we come across a faithful brother and sister in Christ, what more than likely is going to happen? They're going to talk to us about our faithfulness or lack thereof and we find this this prophet running away from God from the presence of God and then in chapter 2 we read about him praying from the belly of the great sea monster and when you read that prayer you'll be surprised that in those what is it 10 15 passages of scripture the man never uses one of his own words to pray but it is a compilation of over 11 psalms secondly he never admits to wrongdoing he never asks for forgiveness he never says i'm sorry but as one commentator said, this is probably as close to a repentance or to an admission of guilt that you'll get from Jonah. Whatever the case might be, while he's in the belly of the sea monster, he says, I'll pay my vows, I'll make the sacrifices, and I long to see the temple of the Lord. He now says, I desire to be in the presence of God. And God commands that this great sea monster spew him out on the seashore. In the first chapter, we see God saving, rescuing the mariners, the sailors. And as they are, are, are afraid for their lives, they say to Jonah, when they figure out that it's Jonah's fault because he is a Hebrew, he worships a God that controls the heavens and the earth, or the creator of the heavens and the earth, and controls nature. They ask Jonah, what should we do with you? And Jonah says what most considered to be the most noble thing, throw me overboard, and that way your life will be saved. But that wasn't a noble thing, was it? What would have been the most noble thing for Jonah to have done? To have said to the sailors, take me to Nineveh so I can do what God told me to do. But he would much rather die than to, than, than to do what God told him to do. So on the beach, full of vomit and seaweed and whatever else came out of the belly of the sea monster. Notice chapter 2, verse 1. Or rather, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. You see, the idea that God has, or the plan that God has for all of us, or the desire, better said, that God has for all of us is that we never sin. As we read there in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, that, that my little children, I, my, my little children I, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate in Christ Jesus, right? So the, the, the plan is, the hope is that we never sin. The hope was that Jonah would have been obedient to begin with. The hope would have been that, that the Assyrians and Nineveh would never have been as mean and terrible and nasty as they were. But that's not the way it worked out. So thank God that we have this mechanism in place called grace and compassion and long-suffering of God. Forgiveness. That has been put in place when there is repentance on, the behalf, on our behalf. Now, when you read Jonah, you can identify many miracles. You can identify the miracle of the great storm that God sent at that time. You can identify the great sea monster that was prepared and how Jonah survived in the belly of this great sea monster for three days and three nights pointing to the burial and resurrection of Jesus. But I, I want to share with you what I think is the greatest miracle of all here in the third chapter. Now, I'm using the word miracle, I understand, when I talk about repentance, 
But we're going to see in this lesson that this contentious, disobedient, miserable old cuss of a prophet accomplished more in one day with a five-word sermon than any missionary in modern time has ever been able to accomplish. And that's why I use the term miracle loosely. So let's look about, let's look back at what God had said to this selfish prophet. There in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1. God says to Jonah, I, I want you to go and, and, and preach to these people that I'm going to destroy them in 40 days unless they, they repent. You know, what that tells me is that that was the original mission that God gave to Jonah. And Jonah threw a temper tantrum and decided to hide in a boat and run away from the presence of God. But even after he prayed in the belly of the sea monster for three days and three nights, even after he was spewed out, even after he did all those things, that temper tantrum didn't change what God had commanded him to do. God still tells him, go and preach. So let's look at what repentance is. Now, most Bible students, when you ask them, what does repentance mean? They'll tell you, well, repentance is, is a change of mind. Repentance means change your mind. But I think that it has to do more than changing your mind. It has to do with changing your attitude. And changing your attitude has to do with changing your heart. Changing how you think. Changing how, how, how you act. You know... Repentance is, is seeing yourself as someone who is good versus bad, or bad versus good. Repentance is, is you seeing yourself in the light that you truly are. That you are wrong, without excuses, without justifications. Seeing yourself, I am bad, I have done wrong. And I need to get to the good side. It's seeing God as someone that you need to get to as quickly as possible. During the 80s, early 90s, before cell phones were popular, well, they did exist then, but they were in big boxes and bags. Most people had, business people had pagers or papers. And the they could afford the fancy ones had the ones that not only would record the number but would record a message. And my father had the one that would receive a message. It was a Wednesday around 6:45 in Bible study started at seven. And he still hadn't been to the house. And I remember calling my dad, and he was in a business meeting. And I said to him, I don't know where you are. You need to get home quickly because I need to get to church. And my dad says that his, his, his colleagues during that business meeting looked at him and said, I don't know what's going on, but it sounds like your son is in a mess of trouble. You better get to church. And I don't remember what it was, but I'm sure I needed to get to church quickly. Repentance is seeing God as someone that you must get to quickly and get right with. It demands a change of action. It demands, as John the Baptist said, fruits that are worthy of repentance. Matthew 3 and verse 8. Repentance comes from this fancy Greek word, which means an afterthought. And indeed, you don't repent before you sin. Because if you repent before you sin, then that means that you planned it out and it was premeditated. And you know that when you stand before a judge and a jury, the sentence is greater for premeditated murder than accidental death. So repentance is an afterthought, hindsight, 2020. It's after you've made or committed the wrong, 
and you feel remorse and regret, and you wish you hadn't done it, and you wish that you could go back and fix it, and it is that breaking of the spirit, that, that breaking of, of the heart that makes you want to come back like the prodigal son. Repentance involves more than sorrow, though. It involves action. Again, in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, he realized, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I don't deserve to be called your son. So what shall I do? I shall go to my father. I'll get up and go to my father. Repentance involves stripping yourselves of all excuses and not blaming anyone or any circumstance of why you failed and sinned. Now there have been many occasions that folks have come forward to ask the church for forgiveness for their sins and they'll say something like, if I have offended you. Well, that conditional if, if that's how you're going to confess wrongdoing, then don't do it at all. Because that's not accepting responsibility. It's like a person that goes to the judge and he says, I want to plead guilty, but I'm not guilty. Either you are or you aren't. Either you're going to ask for forgiveness or you're not. Either you're guilty or you're not. Repentance requires us stripping ourselves of all justification, of all excuse making, and accepting that we have messed up. And look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse 1. Forgiveness once granted does not release us from our responsibility. Because as Jonah found out after he was out of the mouth of the great, or out of the belly of the great sea monster, God said, get up and go. And do what I originally told you to do. Now you know what would happen to a child if you told that child to take the trash out and that child kicked and screamed and beat his or her head on the concrete and said, No. And then you said, oh, poor little thing, and you cuddled that little baby, that little toddler of yours, or kid, whatever. And after the tears are dried up, you say, I'm going to play Nintendo, or whatever new game system's out there. You've just taught that child that by throwing a temper tantrum, they can get away with not doing what they're told to do. And that child will grow up to be an adult that's just like that. But God said to Jonah, you've done crying now, you've done running away, now go and do what I told you to do. So let's read the first four verses of Jonah 3. Now after, or now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. A three days walk. This is the second time in two verses we're told that Nineveh was a great city. In chapter 1 we're told that, she was a, that it was a great city plus wicked. And then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk. And he cried out and said, yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And forgiveness is such a beautiful thing. That when Jonah goes and preaches this sermon, five-word sermon in Hebrew, yet in 40 days an interval will be overthrown, it's hard for me to imagine that if, if the book of Jonah only contained the first two chapters, it's hard for me to imagine that Jonah would have ever gone and fulfilled this mission. But since we have the third chapter, we, we know that Jonah went and preached... Repentance to these people. We read that Jonah repented, right? His own way, but he repented. Not only do we read that Jonah repented, but if you, if you go there uh, uh, in, in verse, um, uh, verse 5, we read that the people repented, which is quite interesting. But 
what was Jonah's attitude? When he was in the belly of the great sea monster, when he was praying to, to God, was Jonah saying, oh, I just can't wait to get out of here and go to Nineveh. Boy, just let me out. I, I, I've, I've got something great to say to them, God, whatever. I, that wasn't his attitude. This was a reluctant prophet. But not only did he do what he was told to do with the reluctant attitude, which we'll read about later. But notice in verse 5. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. Notice that they didn't believe in Jonah. Who did they believe in? They believed in God. They believed that God could do whatever Jonah was saying that God would do. And that's important. That's how you learn to fear God. By believing that God will do what He says He will do. If God says that He will punish the wicked in eternal hellfire, if you believe that, then you're more apt to repent and change your ways. If you believe that God will, will, will reward those that are faithful to Him with eternal life in heaven, then you're more apt to stay with God. Well, in, in verse 5, they believed in God and, and they called a fast and put on a sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from this throne, laid aside his robe from him, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes and issued a proclamation and said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king of the nobles, do not let man or beast or anyone else eat, drink, or taste a thing. But both man and beast must be covered in sackcloth and let man call or let man call on God earnestly that each may turn. Here is repentance, right? That each may turn from its wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger that we may not perish. So not only did Jonah repent, but Nineveh repented. Now, this is why I have approached this lesson from the standpoint of the great miracle of repentance. Which I know that many people have repented throughout the history of time, and that's not a miracle in itself. But we're talking about a city that God says is a great city. 1,500 towers surrounded the city of Nineveh. Each tower was 200 feet tall. The walls were so wide that three chariots of war could ride or patrol on it side by side. That's an amazing feat. It took 1.4 million slaves eight years to build these towers and these walls. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11, the Word of God says that there were 120,000 children that had not reached the age of moral accountability, which estimates say that there were over 2 million people living within the city walls of Nineveh. That's a great city. But what about this great city? In Jonah chapter 1, it says it was a wicked city. It was so wicked... We read about in, in, in uh, historical documents that it was an affluent city. It was a decadent city. That for entertainment purposes, they would do worse than what the Romans had done. They had built stadiums, and inside those stadiums, they would put men and women and children in those stadiums and release wild beasts, bears and lions and wild beasts, and just for entertainment purposes... See those beasts kill these people, devour them, tear them from limb to limb. They would take their enemies and, and decapitate them, take their heads off and build large pyramids. And then take people and tie them alive to these pyramids and allow the beasts to come and tear them up as well. Eat them alive, the birds of the sky to feed off of them. 
They would flay or skin the people alive and take the skin and use that skin to upholster their thrones, to upholster the walls of their homes. They would stake their heads and make walls out of their heads. These were terrible people, these Assyrians. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They lived an extremely luxurious lifestyle. Food and wine. All kinds of decadent lifestyle. Entertainment galore. If you read Nahum chapter 3, verse 1. 150 years after Jonah prophesied. It said, woe to the bloody city of Nineveh. People are tripping over the bones of the dead bodies in Nineveh. And verse 10 talks about how they would take these little children by the ankles alive. And then just dash their skulls on the, on the ground to see their brains just explode. It was a terrible city. And all two million of them. At the hearing in one day's preaching. A five word sermon. Repented. Now. Could this be the reason why Jonah did not want to go and preach to these people? Because of how terrible and wicked this, these people were. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, like during the 1970s, where that crazy guy, the Khmer Rouge, uh, I forget his name, Pop something, uh, that, that killed millions of people in, in concentration camps or, or Adolf Hitler during World War II, that you know the atrocities that, that he committed. Imagine you being there at that time. And you have been commissioned to go and preach salvation to a man that is gassing innocent people that's committing genocide. Would you be willing to do that? Would you think that that man deserves salvation? Probably not. And it could be the, this could be the reason why Jonah didn't want to go and preach to him or to them. Because this is a bloody city that does not deserve salvation. It could be. But here's the rub. And here's the question for you to think about personally. Is there a Nineveh in your life? Is there someone that you think that you hate, that you despise so much? That you're not willing to share the gospel with. The truth is that I think. That there might be an end of it in almost every one of us. So it's not so far fetched is it? But the miracle if you call it that. If you allow me to call that. Is that all two million of these people according to the scriptures repented. Forty days. When you read the fourth chapter, we read about Jonah taking his toys, leaving the city, just sitting out there waiting to see what happens. Day one ha passes, day two, nothing happens, day three, nothing happens, day four. He waits 40 days just seeing if, if God's going to destroy them, but, but they repented. Why 40 days? Well, you look at Scripture, 40 was one of those, is one of those numbers that seems like it, it, was, it was a time that God gave people to think about things. Elijah and Jesus both fasted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Moses and Israel for 40 years in the desert. 40 days and 40 nights, God destroyed the earth in the days of Noah. But whatever the case, here the people believed God. Which tells me also what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. That as a preacher, sometimes we are tempted to preach what people want to hear and not what people need to hear. 
Because it would have been so easy for, for Jonah to go into this decadent, luxurious society that was so evil, afraid that they might even kill him for the words that he was speaking, to teach them or tell them what they wanted to hear. But Paul said to Timothy, you preach the word in season and out of season, which means you preach the word whether they want to hear it or not. And he did that. And preachers like us that are on salary, sometimes we might be tempted to not step on people's toes. Because as I, as I said before, you tick off the wrong people, the influential contributors, that might be your job. But you have to do what God has commissioned you to do. Now look at verse 5. Verse 5 through, through 9. What did these people do to show that they were sorry? They, they put on sackcloth. They sat on ashes. They fasted. They didn't eat or drink or taste anything. Which are fruits worthy of repentance. They weren't demanding anything. And, and, and notice, notice what the king says. Who knows in verse 9. Who knows. Maybe perchance. God will turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Not only did Nineveh repent, but the king repented. So we have Jonah repenting, repenting the Assyrians repenting, the king repenting. But here's the last one that I'll share with you that repented. That might be the most difficult to accept. Verse 10. And when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God, if you're reading New King James, says, then God repented or relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Yes, God repented. God changed his mind. I know that that might be difficult for some of us to hear. But before I get to that, why did all these people repent? I go back to the passage we've read where it said that, that the people feared God or the people, people believed uh, uh, the message of, of God. They believed God, not, not Jonah. What brought me... To the point where I needed to obey the gospel as a young man was not the love of God, but the fear of God. I had heard a lesson one evening about heaven, and I thought that was a good lesson. That maybe one day that's where I want to go. Then I heard a second lesson that evening, or in the morning about heaven, and that evening I heard a second lesson about hell. And I knew after that lesson, I might want to go to heaven, but I definitely don't want to go to hell. And it was hell, the fear of hell, the fear of the power of God to send me to hell that made me say, I want to become a Christian right now. There's nothing wrong with being afraid of going to hell. There's nothing wrong with fearing the Lord. There's a healthy fear. I want my children to have a healthy fear of crossing the street. I want my children to have a healthy fear of touching a hot stove. I want the children, my children to have a healthy fear of back-talking their mama. I want my children to have a healthy fear, and we should have a healthy fear of God's power. What should keep us close to Him is our love and His love. But make no, make, make no mistake about it. If God says that he will destroy us lest we repent, he will destroy us. But when he saw that the people repented and brought forth fruits worthy of repentance, he changed. Now again, you might be thinking, wait a second, there's a passage in James chapter 1 
in verse 17 that, that says that, that God cannot change, that, that, that every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shifting shadow. That means that God can't change. Or you might be thinking of, of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. In other words, that He does not change. What these passages are teaching is that God never changes in His plan, in His purpose, in His loving kindness, in His mercy, in His compassion. He doesn't change that. And in those things, He never changes. God has given us His plan, His scheme of redemption. And He's told us what we must do, what He's already done, and what we must do to respond to His message. And He's told us what would happen when we respond, and He's told us what will happen if we don't respond. Those things don't change. Remember when in Genesis 6, verse 6, when God looked down upon mankind whom he had made, and it said that God was sorry, the American standard, God repented, King James Version, that he had ever made mankind. Why was God sorry that he had made mankind? This man had gone, become so wicked, so terrible. God had also said to Moses when Moses was up on the mountaintop receiving the Ten Commandments and the people were, were down at the bottom worshiping a golden calf, he said, I, I, Moses, I've changed my mind. I'm going to destroy them and my promise is going to come through your seed. And, and Moses interceded for them and changed God's mind again. But in, as far as compassion, mercy, and God does not change. But here are the facts that I want you to take away with you this morning. But I tell you the truth, Luke 13, verse 5, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Those who refuse to repent will indeed be destroyed. And it is a fact that after this story of Jonah, that 150 years later, the Assyrians came and took 10 of the 12 tribes and punished Israel. And then later, God came and destroyed and finished off Assyria. But it wasn't after, I mean, it wasn't until after God had given them a chance. And God is a God of second chances. What, would you, what will you do with your second chance? And this morning, God has given you the opportunity to consider your spiritual condition. God has given you the chance to, while you're in the belly of the sea monster, while you're fasting for 40 days, while you're thinking your life through, God has given you the opportunity to think about your spiritual condition. If you've not confessed with your mouth that Jesus is a Son of God, if you've not made up your mind to repent, to change the way that you live and think, and dedicate your life to God, if you've not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin by immersion. Then the punishment, Luke 13 verse 5, is eternal destruction. You've had your 40 days. You've had your three days in the belly of the sea monster. It's time now to get up and do what you were told to do. To obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why not do that? Right now, together we stand and sing.